I agreed to do this interview for two reasons, ah, ah, one of which is not important, and the other uh, eludes me for the moment. <laughs> This is a small town near Stockport called Marple. It's not one of my favourite places, but for Steve Heap, it's been his home for most of his life. Steve isn't easy to describe, but it's easier to say that he's one of the most talented and uncompromising people I've ever met. He's a musician, songwriter and producer of his own material. He's never been signed to a record company, He's entirely self-funded, and yet he's recorded more than 20 albums. This Marple townhouse has been Steve's home for the last five years. It's also home to Funsville Mimetic Laboratories. This one-man media organisation goes back a long way. But for the origins of Steve's musical activities, you have to go back even further. Do you know, we had a piano, and I remember plinky plonking on it uh, when I was about three. My mum said, don't plinky plonky on the piano, wiped it off. Uh, so I started playing around. I, I could do a few uh, tunes, little tunes. So I got piano lessons at the age of uh, five until about twelve, which, uh, you know, I didn't become a, a brilliant classical pianist, but I was all right, and uh, I, have a, I have a musical ear. In 1986, Steve was invited to join a friend's band as a keyboard player. By this time, he was more interested in bands like The Damned and The Dead Kennedys than classical music. His songwriting reflected this, and Steve looked for ways to get his ideas down on tape. I first started uh, recording my own music in the uh, uh, summer of 85, I think, I think it was August, as I said earlier. Uh, just the odd thing now, but I really got into it. I think I had the enthusiasm, but not the, not the, the technology and equipment available, so obviously the old recordings are pretty ropey and stuff. I had the, the enthusiasm to do them, I and mean, I, I gradually got more and more. I got a guitar in 86, and uh, I got a bass in, I think that was 86 as well. And what else? The tin pot drums. I didn't have any Didn't have any drums, but I had like some plastic tubs, and uh, one of these tall coffee tins with a plastic lid for, you know, offices have. Um, and I had a couple of metal sticks wrapped some insulating tape around them, and I used to play drums on that. There was like a tub full of old coins. That gave you a cross between a snare and a hi-hat kind of sound. It was some drummy sound, so I used tin pot drums. By connecting a series of standard cassette decks, Steve developed a primitive two-track recording system and recorded his first four albums in this way. So I kept going. I, wasn't, I was never disappointed because the sound quality was, was, was shite or, or was bad or anything, because I knew it would be, but it was just... I could hear... I've recorded my own songs and I can have a, have a listen to it back and stuff. By the time of his fifth album in 89, Steve had bought a four-track porter studio. I don't know whether belonging to Steve would be four-track heaven or hell, but either way, it survived nearly ten years of extensive heavy-duty use. Today, Steve combines digital and computer technology with an analog 8-track. I asked him to explain how it works. There we go, so we've got the, the drums there, this has been written on the uh, composer and uh, piped through here with a nice long extension lead built by my own fair hand. Now I record the bass there on one uh, and go back, start again, add some guitar. Uh, in this case I've added another guitar later on. Okay, and then you've got some keyboards on four, but not much. There we go. And then what you do is, you mix all that it all back down onto the other two spare tracks, five and six, which I've done in that case. 
and then later on I can record over the first four and then maybe add some vocals or just shout. I could just shout on it. Or I could get the kazoo out and go <laughs> over it. One pound. It's actually better than the metal two pound ones I found. There you go. You get guaranteed buzz if you play the wrong way around. Kazoo playing a trick number eight. I don't think I'm actually going to do this, but there you go. Me next, that's right, you asked for it. Sex of violence. It takes dozens of hours to write, record, mix, and design an album. And instead of around 10 tracks, Steve averages about 20 per album. After all these years of recording, Steve now has a huge archive of material. Well, now, yes, there was the project. I set myself this month. Uh, I think I started it in mid-June, it took me a couple of months to, to uh, get onto CD everything I'd ever recorded, or recorded enough tracks of to count as something complete that you could listen to. I've now got an hour worth for the 36th CD and they're all nearly full, they're probably average six, uh, 70 minutes. 36 times 7 sixths, which is 42 hours. So around about 42 hours. So that's, it's, it's a shitload altogether. It is quite a lot. This back catalogue is impossible to categorise. Steve records whatever takes his interest, regardless of who'll hear it, or what's considered cool or uncool. Steve's latest release, FML 2020, is something of a landmark as it attempts to span his recording career. It's the 20th album and it's 20 songs from a 20 year period. Now of course I had to cheat because those of you doing the maths will know that 2002 minus 1985 is 17. So track one is actually a piece of music which was used on the test card. I recorded a version of that, but in 1982, do you see? This, this thing called Carry Me Back to Old Virginia and it bounces along and you have to do the pointy dance to it here. It's excellent. Yeah. <laughs> With the Terry and June bit in the middle. The way to get the Terry and June, if you've ever, if you've ever really wanted to play the, the theme from Terry and June, the important thing is that the, the, the two notes playing the, the melody are three octaves apart. Yeah. Three octaves. That's the same. <laughs> and not a lot of people know that. Now, why you would want to waste time playing the same tune from Terry and June is beyond me. But, three octaves, three, mate. <laughs> Stop throwing those bloody sweet suits at me. Got her a bit of that, haven't you? Yeah. Big dogs dice go floating down the river, floating down the river of time. Big dogs dice go floating down What's remarkable about Steve's output is that almost no one knows about it. Very few people ever hear his work. He expresses himself through music, but needs no one to validate this expression. It's just what he does for himself. Well, I think since I was about seven, I've, uh, I've always had a tune in my head. Not absolutely always, obviously, I haven't right now. Of course, one's going to pop into my head now, isn't it? Just to spite me. I don't know why I even bother. It's just something I've always done, and I've carried on doing it. And um, that's probably part of the reason why I never bother, you know, sending these things off or anything. Part of the reason is because I know that it's actually the best music in the world. And if anyone wants to take an interest in it, that's up to them. I don't know why I even, I don't know why I even bother. The main thing is there's no particular uh, goal other than to record a song and, and hear it. And I don't think oh, I've got to do so, so, so many hours of music a year or whatever. Or I've got to, I don't think I've got to do anything. I just do it when I want to. And when I have a great, a great idea, or what I think is a great idea, which sends everyone else running in panic, <clears throat> then I'll finally eventually get round to it. Two, three, four. I can't be bothered with all the competition side of it. But it's always just been a hobby. The album's kind of an extension of that. Really. Oh well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's gone to that bad evening. Well, I don't know about you, but I just sit back and relax with the drink and listen to a definitely long head roll.
pocket of polo means the table is open. Joystick, but I forgot. <laughs> 